Hello Interwebs, welcome to Let's Build Computers. Um, we're doing another case swap today. Uh, this one came in um, last week. Uh, the client is looking to get it put into a new computer case. They were looking for recommendations. Um, and so we had a conversation about the computer and what kind of thing they were looking for and what they didn't like about this one. And a lot of people, you know, I, I showed pictures of this on my on my Discord server, link in the description. Um, and they were like, oh man, that looks all right as it is, you know. However, the thing is, is that if we take off the side panel, um, this case has just got a couple of deficiencies which just don't really work for what the for what the client wants. So if we take off this side panel, um, as you can see in here, there's no power supply shroud. So the power supply cables are just at the bottom there. You know, it's just blah. And there's the you know, it's like so you might say, okay, well you route them around the back, right? Well, about that. This is, uh, this is a thermal tape case. I'm not sure what the model number of it is. Someone in the comments will know, I'm sure. We turn it round. Ooh, as you can see, it's tempered glass on both sides. So you can't hide the cables around the back either. So basically, unless you do a proper Reddit grade cable pornography job on this case, you can't win. And that is exactly, I think, why the client wants to get rid of this case. Um, so we, 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 we spoke about it and, um, and the client said, uh, I want it to be I want it to be big, I want it to be flashy, I want all my RGB, because we've got RGB fans on the front as well, as you can see there. I want all the RGB, um, I want room for three, my three hard drives, and I want USB Type-C on the front as well. Now, all these requirements actually narrowed down the list fairly considerably. However, in the end, what we decided on was a Lianli 011 XL, uh, 011 Dynamic XL, which we've got hiding off shot there, as you can see. Um, so we're going to be rehousing this in the Lianli 011 Dynamic XL. Um, and that's a case I've not worked with before, but I've been having a quick sneaky look at it before I started recording. And man, that's a nice case. We didn't really need it to be the XL, and having seen it in real life, it's not obnoxiously enormous. It's about the same size as this one, but we probably would not would have gotten away with the non-XL version, which is cheaper. However, with that XL, we're gonna have all this, M we're gonna have all this airy space inside, and it's gonna be a really nice sort of cabinet build. Whereas with the non-XL, it would all fit in there, However, you know, it would have been a bit, you know, it, we, we'd start Tetrising with um, like this big uh, uh, RTX 2070 Super and stuff like that. So, uh, as I say, we probably would have got away with the non-XL, but I'm not sad about it. I think we're all right. Uh, and we're going to be able to hide all these cables. We're going to use all this RGB and it's going to be great. So, to start off with, the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to strip this thing down. So, I'm going to take this thing apart. Um, and then we'll take all the parts out and I'm going to build it up in the Lianli. So let's get to it. The headline specs of this build are a Ryzen 3700X, an RTX 2070 Super with 32 gigabytes of Trident Z RGB RAM, all plugged into a gigabyte X570 Aorus Master. There's a huge amount of clutter in this chassis from having a lot of hard drives, SSDs, RGB fans, RGB controllers, and internal USB expansion. These are the symptoms of a PC that was built up and added to over time, and thus a lot of parts inside it were forgotten about or became redundant but were never actually removed. We're going to keep all of the drives as the customer uses them to separate out different media such as games, movies, and so on. You can do the same thing by partitioning the drives if you wanted, but that's a project for another day. We'll have the space for the drives so we can use them. However, we will be pulling out all of the redundant cable splitters and adapters that are adding to this rat's nest.
So this is the Lianli O11 Dynamic XL. Um, and it's the first time I've seen one of these in the flesh and just like the O11 Dynamic, which is, you know, quite a legendary case amongst all the water cooling scene, I believe. Everyone's running around with these last I checked. Um, however, it's a really nice case because what this, what this case gives you is you get the big, huge panoramic glass, tempered glass side panels on it, on the side and front, as you can see. However, it actually has airflow. Because the problem with the tempered glass um, craze is that everyone started putting tempered glass on everywhere. Uh, but obviously, tempered glass means zero airflow. And sort of there's the problem that a lot of modern cases have. Look at UNZXT H500 Elite. Um, and so, however, this, this case doesn't suffer that issue because you've got some reasonably tall feet with a big, huge triple intake along the bottom here. And we've also got a side mount radiator around the, around the back here. You can put down there. It's currently blocked off by hard drive trays, but you remove those and you've actually got a full air intake on the back here. So let's spin this round. So as you can see on the back of the, on the back panel of the case, We've got these two big air intakes, which you can use for full intake or exhaust. Um, so suddenly, the, the the lack of airflow that those tempered glass side panels offer isn't actually a problem in the slightest because you just run your airflow in through somewhere else. So you get the best of both worlds. You get these big, huge glass cabinet tempered side panels, but you still have airflow as well. And on top of that, this is the XL version, which just has a bonkers amount of space. So I'll give you guys a quick tour of this thing. So how it works, ugh, I thought this thing was going to be a bit tetris -y to uh, to work with when I was looking at it online. But you take these, you take two screws out the back here, which look like they should be captive, but don't really cap captivate very well. And then the top comes off. Like that. Then these side panels lift out. Now, the great thing about this is obviously it's quite sort of a toolless access. However, you may have been able to hear it while I was moving it about, but one of the things that I'm not a great fan of is quite a lot of rattle. So if I owned one of these, I might just see if I can put just a little bit of foam in these notches to just get rid of that. If you had a bit of a wobbly desk, that could be something that could be very irksome. And the back comes off in the same way. And then that's got two magnetic filters there. And now around the back, it kind of looks a bit spartan at first. However, the way this works is we've got these three modular bays. And the bottom one is designed for our main power supply. Then the middle and top one here, if I take that out, has got dual hard drive bays in it. Oh, those need one screw, but two hard drive base here, two hard drive base here. But this entire hard drive caddy module can come out and you could put another power supply there. And it's got the screw mounts there. And heck, you could put a third one at the top if you're that kind of person. I'm sure there's someone out there who's done that. And you could run th triple power supplies in this thing. But short of that, you can go power supply, one, two, three, four power uh, hard drives. Then uh, you got one, two, three, one, two, three uh, hard drive bays there. Or you can put uh, SSDs on those as well, two and a half inch, I think. And then you've got more there. So we've got what, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hard drive bays straight off the bat if you wanted to fully load this thing. It's nuts. Right, so with that in mind, let's start getting the uh, stuff into here. So we're going to start just by dropping the motherboard in here, then we'll swap around to the back and stick the power supply in, and we'll go from there. So, board please, Caradog. Thank you. Now, this thing is heavy built up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a badass motherboard. Oh, it goes in there. There's a lot of headroom in this thing. Are you going to water cooler first around up to the top to here? Or are you going to water cool it down there? I think that way. Yeah. Or are you going to top mount? No, here for the fans. I you? want it to be at the side. Um, it's going to be tough. Oh, no, actually, it's a modern Corsair, so it should have fairly flexible cables. Because we're not allowed to have hoses up anymore. That's illegal. 
Yeah, I think we can work around that. I think you're going to get there. And then we probably go for something like that that would steer around the graphics card. I think you can get that or you can get that if that's nicer. Or I, you can, yeah, I think no, you, you can't go down. So yeah, you'd be about there. Yeah. That would that would work nicer, you're right, and just go high mount. Or if we just bring it down enough. I'm looking at the blanking plates. They're not quite in alignment. Yeah. Low mount tubes are a pain in the ass, but however, I understand that it does work better, and also on a, I think it affects Corsairs as well. Mm. Because obviously you could top mount it. At yeah. The, um, offset slightly over here. See, the problem is that leap. I feel like that's a complete waste of having this feature in the case. Yeah, I like that idea. I was going to say the other other possibility is either top intake or intake through radiator and exhaust out top. Are you going to exhaust through the radiator to go in there and out there? Basically? Yeah, I, th I think that's the best way of doing it. Right, so we've got our hot swap hard drive bays, which give you two drives that'll be powered from... So each one SATA connector will power the two drives in the bay, and we've got a pair of SATA power leads coming out... Uh, sorry, SATA data leads coming out of that. So we'll sort of pull those out of the way and then our power supply goes in at the bottom. Uh, this is a RGB controller down here, uh, which handles the RGB strip down the front. And I, that then can go into your motherboard for the sender. And that is, yeah, that is a hub. You can have a couple of things plugged into that, I believe. It's really nice having actual open access to the back of the power supply for plugging in modular cables. We do have uh, dual 8 pins going to this motherboard. It doesn't need both 8 pins, but we've got them on we've got them on the power supply and we've got them on the motherboard, so we'll connect them up anyway. However, completely unnecessary. Actually, should we legit just put one in? Just to have one less cable in the case, because well, modular power supply we can take. As we far can as well, there is only one out. anyway in this bundle. Um, no, there were two. Yeah, I think we'll we'll stick one of them back in the power supply box because yeah, this computer does not need two. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll we'll stick one back in the box and just have one fewer cables in the entire build. Okay, right, right. You're doing hard drives. Uh, power supply. I'm gonna start sorting out all these front panel wires. This is this is the this is the awkward section of building a PC where you've done an initial exciting bit where you put in the motherboard and you put in the power supply, and then comes about half an hour of just running all the cables in roughly into place. And there's quite a lot of them on this case because we've got uh, we've got four five front USB ports. We've got quad USB 2 and a USB type C. Sorry, quad USB 3 and a type C. Screws. It seems entirely unnecessary that this RG this little RGB hub down here needs a SATA power connector when it's only two channel. It seems entirely unnecessary for it to exist. Yeah, I'm, well, why yeah. Couldn't, they, why couldn't this controller be integrated into this? Yeah, or failing that, you know, just for the complexity of RGB on this, they could have just had the, the strip down the front and have that literally just come out onto this, you know? Yeah. Right, so... Our reaches. Yeah, it's absolutely fine. We'll uh, we'll go for the smooth loop, and then if we can, if we can, we could get the pack, we can get the graphics card cables to loop like that. So we've got loops and loops, and get some parallel loops going on.
Frustratingly, the RGB in this system is handled by a Corsair Lighting Node Pro that has a six channel expansion module connected to it. This means that despite only having three fans to manage, because the radiator fans are handled by the AIO, we have two RGB boxes, both of which require SATA power. This RGB system would be fine if it was in a big system because it would allow us to connect up to 12 RGB fans for a single USB port. However, on this time, we'll have to put some of this wiring clutter back in. The Corsair Lighting Node Core would be a better option for this as it's got six channels and a USB connection, so it does the job of both of these boxes in a single unit. And that's this build completed. So this was um, this was a longer build than uh, than than we expected. It took us quite a long time. As with all things, as soon as RGB gets involved, um, it adds a huge amount onto the build time. It's surprisingly time consuming, just routing the RGB cables and getting the control boxes in place and stuff like that. Um, in, in addition to that, the RGB cabling does add a lot of extra spaghetti around the back. Um, so in terms of the fan layout and stuff, as you can see, we opted to have the low intake here, um, which unfortunately puts the, the RGB rings of these fans facing down. But from any other angle, um, you know, from any angle, you can clearly see the rings um, through the fan blades. So you do still see that nice splash of color in there that makes a really nice sort of um, gradient glow on the fan blades. It's a really nice effect. Um, Corsair RGB, for all the hassle the cabling was, looks spectacular. Um, and having them down there, this works really well as a low intake. This is obviously all filtered down the bottom here. Um, and then we've got the um, uh, we've got the AIO water cooler doing the exhaust out the side panel of the case there. And that means that that is nice and on show. Uh, alternative ways to do this might have been to stick the AIO up the top um, and go for a top exhaust, but then that would have left an empty space down on this side bit. And I feel like you're kind of missing the point of this case if you don't have a water cooling rad on the side. Um, we could of course have gone for um, we could have gone for a uh, a top exhaust and a side intake. That still would have left the back of these fans showing us. Or another thing that we could have done was go for a top intake um, and then a side exhaust. So we could have done a top intake through the radiator and then had three fans along the back for the exhaust. Um, however, while that would have been functional, I feel like that wouldn't have actually been doing anyone any favours. Whereas having these fans down the bottom there, going for this arrangement, what we do get is that low intake straight into the graphics card, which really does the graphics card a lot of favours. Um, this is obviously going to be sitting up on a desk. So I don't. while I'm not a big fan of bottom intakes, while it's sitting on a desk, I've got no concerns about that at all. Um, the size of the case, I was a little bit intimidated by how big this thing was when I unboxed it. And I thought, have I made a massive mistake? Should I have gone for the non-XL? Um, however, having it all in there, there is lots of empty space in there. But because of the style of this case with the big front and side windows, it looks more like a cabinet than a case. And I really like that. 
Um, I like having the space around it. It means you can see everything from all angles. You know, it's not all crammed in there and it's not all covering each other up. With a lot of MIDI towers, by the time you've got fans here or up here or your um, the uh, the radiator mounted sideways and stuff, you're starting to cover things up and then cables cover things up and it all squashes in. And you can see stuff in there. However, with this on show, you've got everything just suspended in the middle, which I think actually looks really nice. And that includes, you know, we, as you can see, I opted for no rear exhaust over here. And again, I think that all adds to it, just having this open space inside with the actual components on show like that. So yeah, I, I quite like how this came out. Uh, with RGB, as you can see, we've just got it all on Spectrum Wave at the moment. Spectrum Wave on white actually looks quite good. I like the effect a lot. In fact, well, I don't hate Rainbow Wave in general. When your RGB is set up right, Rainbow Wave can look really nice for a showcase like this. So, eh. either way, the point is it's customizable. The advantage about RGB is not necessarily that you're going to have it on Rainbow Puke all the time. Is that you can choose what it will look like. That's the big thing here. It's up to you what color it all is. And leaving it on RGB like this, the reason why I always put them on our, on just Rainbow Wave when I'm doing the video is to demonstrate all these things changing color to show you how all of these things that are changing color can be any color you want. And that's the point. Um, if you want to, you could change it all to white. You could change it all to blue. You could change it all to green. It can be whatever you want. So with that, that's the end of this computer. We've done a little bit of other tweaks to it as well that we discussed with the customer with terms of overclocking and stuff like that. Um, the uh, the Ryzen 3700X in there, um, I've actually advised leaving that at stock because at the moment there's a lot of questions about when Ryzen overclocking is actually useful on a daily driver. You may be able to get high benchmark scores, however, but precision boost um, uh, precision boost is a weird animal, and uh, sometimes overclocking can mess with your precision boost, which hurts your general single core performance, which can hurt desktop performance, and it's complicated. However, for the minute gains that you really get from overclocking Ryzen, I, I, said to the I said to the client, honestly, I would recommend leaving it at stock and just letting Precision Boost take care of that. Um, the graphics card, we have still got a modest overclock dialed into this. Um, I checked the customer's overclock and they'd actually already gotten a modest improvement out of it. And after checking it myself, um, there, wasn't, there, there wasn't a huge amount more to give from it um, without getting into the nitty gritty. Um, one thing that would have been really nice is, uh, I mean, obviously a triple fan rad would have been nice to fill out this space a bit better. Um, however, obviously then you would have had to go for the top mount hoses as well. Unfortunately, the meta now is low mount hoses. I really wanted to turn that over and have it in the center. However, I have suspicion that um, I'll, get, I'll get crucified in the comments if I put the hoses at the top of the radiator because that's the way it is now. Um, past that, stick around for the end card for all of my support links for my Twitter, my Patreon, and my Discord server. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I'll see you all next time. Bye for now.